1999, movie audiences got to go face to face with an old movie monster legend while going on a swashbuckling adventure where Brandon Fraser plays Rick O'Connell, a former soldier of the French Foreign Legion who sets out on an adventure with brother and sister duo Evelyn Carnahan played by Rachel Wise and Jonathan played by John Hanna. Set in 1920s Egypt, they set off to find the lost city of Harmanatra so they can find all its riches and treasures, but instead they wake up an old ancient evil in the form of Imhotep, played by Arnold Voslo, a mummy from beyond the grave who will do anything to bring his forbidden love back to life and will destroy the world in the process. In an action-packed adventure where our heroes must face monsters, plague and the fire and brimstones of the end of the world. So today we are going to discuss what The Mummy would have been like if it was a gruesome horror movie directed by Clive Barker. What if Leonardo DiCaprio was cast as the movie's heroic lead? And how the movie was saved with a decent budget? All thanks to this little pig. As we look into 10 things that you didn't know about The Mummy. The one that for a long while everyone thought was meh, but since the Tom Cruise version came out we can now see it as an awesome film. So let's check it out. Number 10, it was originally going to be a Clive Barker project. Believe it or not, but The Mummy was nearly brought back onto the screen at the hands of Hellraiser and Candyman creator, Clive Barker. And his original vision was a lot different to the final one that we got. It was in 1992 that Universal Pictures greenlit a modern remake of the classic 1932 monster movie, The Mummy thanks to producer team James Jack and Sean Daniel, who had produced several movies together, including Dazed and Confused, Hearts and Souls, Hard Target, and Tombstone. The Mummy was to be made on a low budget of $10 million, and Barker was initially brought on board to helm the project. Barker's vision would have been set in present-day 90s and revolved around a museum whose owner was a member of the occult and performing rituals to bring the ancient mummy back to life. The original vision was described as being full of violence and sex. However, as the project went on, Barker and Universal Studios just weren't seeing eye to eye. So Barker parted ways from the project, taking the production back to square one. However, I would still like to see Barker's vision of the mummy brought onto the big screen. Number nine, then it went through several other directors' hands. So after the failings of Clive Barker's vision of the mummy, Universal then turned to Gremlins director Joe Dante, who, like Barker, also had his own unique vision of the mummy. Dante's vision was also set in present day, and was more of a tragic love story about an ancient mummy brooding for his long lost love, making the character more tragic. I can't help but feel like this approach was more in line with Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula movie, which would have been released around about that time. Actor Daniel Day-Lewis was being eyed up to play the mummy, and this version was actually nearly made. But Dante's vision went beyond the budget Universal planned to give the movie, so Dante was out. Then Night of the Living Dead director George A. Romero was brought on board, because who else better to get to direct a mummy movie than the King of Zombies himself? And like Dante, his vision was a love story, only it was about a female archaeologist who digs up the tomb of Imhotep, who is brought back to life via an MRI scan, where he then reforms his youthful appearance and sparks up a romance with the female archaeologist, where all kinds of chaos ensues, what with other mummies coming back to life and seeking revenge and so on. This script was considered too dark and Romero had to leave the project as he was contractually tied to MGM Studios. A Nightmare on Elm Street director Wes Craven was approached to direct, but he turned down the offer. Then Critters 2 director Mick Garris was on board to direct, but he also jumped ship. It seemed that one issue that kept cropping up along the way of The Mummy's failed attempts was its restricted budget. However, luckily salvation of increasing the movie's budget came from the unlikeliest of places. Number 8, Babe the Pig helped to get the budget increased. 
Universal Pictures went through something of a reform after the release of the Babe sequel, Babe, Pig in the City. The sequel about the adorable talking pig was anticipated to be a sure hit. However, it was a box office dud, which led to Universal to change management and quickly set out to make a big box office hit to make up for the losses of Babe, Pig in the City. So Universal got more enthusiastic with The Mummy Project and increased its budget from $15 million to $80 million. And Stephen Summers, whom had just previously directed Deep Rising, came on board along with his vision, which is what the final film was. His take on The Mummy was described as being the 1930s mummy mixed with Indiana Jones and Jason and the Argonauts. Number seven, Leonardo DiCaprio was nearly the movie's lead. Despite being a remake of The Mummy, the movie's main character is just as much Richard O'Connor than it is the actual Mummy, who is like a rough around the edges, tough Indiana Jones type character, complete with vulnerabilities and humor. And Universal were eyeing up several Hollywood actors to take on the role, including Tom Cruise, who ironically would star in the 2017 remake, along with Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, and Brad Pitt, none of whom were interested or available. However, an actor who was interested was Leonardo DiCaprio, who was big business at the time thanks to starring in Titanic. However, despite his enthusiasm, he was contractually stuck to starring in the psychological thriller, The Beach. DiCaprio tried to get The Beach's production postponed so he could also star in The Mummy, and his requests were denied. So, unfortunate for him, he left the project. The irony is, is The Beach's production ended up getting postponed anyway, so he could have starred in The Mummy after all. Brandon Fraser was cast because Stephen Summers and the producers were impressed with his performance in George of the Jungle. And let's be honest, he does a pretty good kick-ass job in the movie, and I could not imagine the movie without him. Number 6. Filming Location Woes Filming of The Mummy commenced at Morocco and the Sahara Desert. A horseshoe crater-shaped volcano formation called Gara Madora in Morocco was used to build the city of Harmanatra. Filming at the desert locations took its strain on the cast and crew involved in making The Mummy, as they had to face issues such as dehydration, of which the production's medical team had to create a special rehydration drink that the crew would have to drink periodically every two hours. The cast and crew also had to deal with snakes and spiders, and on several occasions, crew members would have to be hospitalized after getting bitten. And all while the crew also had to deal with daily sandstorms, which also plagued the set locations. Basically, filming this movie was anything but easy. In fact, the cast members even had kidnapping insurances taken out on them, something the cast wasn't even aware of at the time. However, filming also commenced on sound stages at Shepperton Studios in England, which thankfully there wasn't any sandstorms there. So while of all the hazards that took place during filming, it's a good thing that no one nearly died, right? Right? Uh, well, we'll get back to that later. Number five, the music of the mummy. The music of the mummy was composed by movie scoring legend Jerry Goldsmith, who each time I bring him up, I cannot praise him enough. I love his score in the mummy. It has that Goldsmith sound while also sounding new and fresh. He has many Middle Eastern and Egyptian cues in the score, while also having some adventurous ones, ones that could give the Indiana Jones score a run for its money. To me, The Mummy is one of the last great Goldsmith scores. In fact, Goldsmith was actually quite busy at the time, as he was also scoring The Haunting, The Thirteenth Warrior, and Hollow Man. Sadly, several years later in 2004, Goldsmith passed away, and we lost one of the all-time great movie composers. And The Mummy stands out as a testament to being one of his greatest, last, truly classical scores. Goldsmith would also win a BMI award for best music. Man, I really miss Jerry Goldsmith. Number four, alternative beginning. The Mummy starts off with a flashback scene set in ancient Egypt, where we learn of Imhotep's forbidden love affair with the Pharaoh King's wife, Anuxalamun, which incidentally led to his mummification. The start, however, was going to be slightly different. 
As a callback to its source material, the Universal Pictures logo at the start of the movie was going to be that of the classic 1930s Universal logo, which would have then faded to the hot desert sun, and the sequence was to be narrated by the Imhotep character himself, aka Arnold Vosloo. However, director Stephen Summers then realised that the Imhotep character doesn't speak English, only ancient Egyptian, so it wouldn't have made sense having the movie starting off with him narrating in English. So instead, the sequence was narrated by the Ardeth Bay character, aka Oded Fur, which, on a narrative level, actually makes more sense. Number 3 Animated Series We all know that The Mummy spawned two sequels and a spin off movie with The Scorpion King. However, there was actually an animated series based off the 1999 Mummy movie. The animated series was produced by Universal Cartoon Studios and consisted of two seasons, broadcasting from 2001 to 2003. And I swear at the time, I never even knew about this series. I don't know if it's because I was just older and just wasn't into cartoons anymore, or if it just wasn't marketed as well in Australia, but <laughs> either way, it passed me by. The series sees the O'Connell family going on adventures around the world, where each adventure would see them face off against the mummy, aka Imhotep. Firstly, the animation is fine, but I'm guessing they couldn't get the rights to the actors' likenesses, as the characters barely look anything like their movie counterparts, nor do their voices sound like them for that matter. I don't know, maybe it's because I didn't grow up watching this cartoon and thus don't have a nostalgic love for it, I'm not really jumping up and down for it. But I would say that it's worth checking out if you're a hardcore fan of the Mummy franchise. And from research I've done, the cartoon storylines do seem pretty interesting, if not a little complex for kids. But hey, I guess that just makes it more interesting. Number two, the Mummy's popularity has had a renaissance. The Mummy was released in May 1999 and made $415 million on an $80 million budget, making it a huge success. And the reviews were also pretty good too. And the movie was nominated for several awards, including an Academy Award for Best Sound. However, I have found that in later years, The Mummy became sort of a popular to not like kind of movie, especially within social media and the online community. So why is this? Well, I have two theories. One, because the CGI effects did age very quickly after the movie's release. And two, maybe because the franchise was bogged down with not very good sequels. However, something I've noticed is that in recent times, there is now a new glowing love that seems to be returning for The Mummy. I'm seeing more and more articles from people declaring their love for it. Like it's suddenly okay to love this movie again. Especially in the light of the recent Tom Cruise remake, it's like people have gone back to the 1999 version and have said, yes, you know what? This is actually one pretty enjoyable adventure movie. And you can't deny that The Mummy 1999 is a fun, kick-ass movie. Number one, Brandon Fraser nearly died making The Mummy. As mentioned, thanks to the locations, the cast and crew didn't have the best of time while making The Mummy, and many of them had to face many hazards. But none of them had it as bad as The Mummy's main star, Brandon Fraser, who came very close to death while making the movie. It's the scene where we see his character hung by the local authorities, while Evelyn bargains for his life. It may look pretty intense on screen, however, it seems that Fraser was actually left hanging a little too long, as he actually stopped breathing. Actress Rachel Wise shared her memory on the ordeal, saying it was terrifying and that Fraser had to be revived. The irony is the same thing happened to Michael J. Fox while filming Back to the Future 3 just nine years earlier. So I guess the moral of the story is when making movies, don't hang your actors. But regardless, despite this mishap, Brandon Fraser still delivered one memorable, action-packed, enthusiastic performance. And it must be said that he does totally steal the show in The Mummy. I remember going to the cinema in 1999 to see The Phantom Menace, and it left a bad taste in my mouth. And then the following week, I went to see The Mummy, which washed out the bad taste and gave me all the fun and enjoyment I was hoping to get from the Star Wars prequel. So for that, I'll always have a love for The Mummy. And if you love the Indiana Jones movies, then you'll love this version of The Mummy, as in my opinion, it's as much a callback to Indy than it is the original 1930s Mummy. Anyway, I'm Minty, 
And I can't believe that throughout this whole episode, I never mentioned Benny once, or how that time he was on the wrong side of the river. <laughs> Blasphemy. See ya!